cool. Okay, I guess we'll get started then. Uh, we're running four minutes behind schedule, but that's how, how, that's how it goes when you're live. Uh, welcome to class, welcome in. Today we'll be talking about induction and recursion, but prior to that, I want to show you something because uh, I've got this. Oops, not that one. Whoops, whoops, not that one. Uh, I, we've got the house points list. Uh, right now, blue team is in the lead with uh, 30 points, and then we've got yellow and I love Brandon at 10. So um, uh, if you're not blue team, you're losing. You have the opportunity to make it up in today's house quiz. So just letting you know um, uh, that's coming up. All right, we will be taking a quiz later. In fact, you're probably going to have to move spots because you're probably not seated in the right arrangement right now. Um, OK, but any burning questions prior to us getting started with this lecture here? Uh, basics homework is due tonight. That's something you have to do. Please do that. Um, in addition, on Piazza, there is a note I published um, uh, about your grading schemes, because you need to do that. So remember I was saying that you, you select your own grading scheme for this semester. There's a Piazza note. It's at 34. Um, there's a handy form little here uh, that you need to fill out. Currently, I have 41 people filling, out, uh, filling it out, and there's like 60 people in the class. So if you have not filled it out, please do. And if you've not filled it out and you're not in this room, we have another problem. Uh, but hopefully, if you're watching this later on, you, you get that. Cool. OK, so I assume that we're all good to go. Um, today, we're talking about induction and recursion. Now, I hope that everyone here knows what both of those two components are individually. And if not, we have a problem, because Concepts was a prereq, um, uh, as well as, I guess, knowing how to program. But, um, uh, but we're going to put the two, two together, because induction is great and recursion is great, but we're going to put them together. So. Our slate for today, we're going to talk about recursion and induction independently. We're going to talk about proving correctness, because why? Programmatic thinking is mathematical thinking. We want to produce code that doesn't just, isn't just written, that we know works. We're in the business of producing correct code. And this will not be the first time I say this to you this semester. I'll show you some more language features in SML, and then we'll do a case study on fast exponentiation, which is a way of implementing exponentiation, but fast. OK, um, so let's go ahead with that. So last lecture, remember, that was Thursday. It was so long ago. You had a whole weekend to do fun things. But remember that we learned about some new types. All right, We learned about tuples. We learned about function types. All of these are pretty cool things that we can use in SML. Uh, and we also talked about variable binding. We talked about how we can bind a variable, and that changes our environment, and how that's different than assignment. Because was, would some like to actually hazard a guess? Why, why is binding different than assignment? What is one way? What do you think? Yeah. We can't change it. We can only shadow it. Absolutely. One, one feedback I got from last lecture was more high chews, so I'm trying my best. Um, we also learned how we can prove stuff. We learned about extensional equivalence, which gave us the property of referential transparency. Equals for equals. I can refactor my code for free. And we fixed some poor fruit trees intern, uh, for some poor fruit tree intern's code using this technique. Okay? We'll see more of that today. All right, but onto the new stuff. There was some stuff I didn't cover last lecture that I wanted to get to, but we didn't have time. So now I got to talk about it now. So this is part zero, equivalence. Um, so I, I mentioned to you that in the first lecture, a value is a kind of final answer. When I have a value, I just have a value. I can't simplify it, I just have the value. And that makes sense for things that are like two, for things that are like the Boolean true. But what about functions? How do I simplify a function? It's not necessarily clear. A uh, question might be, like, if I have something like fn x comma int goes to x plus x, can I simplify this? Or better yet, actually, let's, let's make it more clear. 2 plus 2. Can I simplify this function value, this, this lambda? Well, it's, uh, maybe not necessarily value, but can I simplify it? And I'm going to tell you the answer is no. The answer is no because of a property. Uh, this is called a suspension. This, we'll talk about this more. It's not super important to know now, but the basic idea I'm trying to tell you is that any lambda expression, any lambda expression, doesn't matter what's inside, it must be a value. It always is a value. This 2 plus 2 never happens. It never happens until I get the input argument. So when I give it this x, then we do the 2 plus 2. Okay? This is kind of a side note, but I just wanted you to know that. So basically, functions are values. but well, something else we want to say about values is that it should be obvious when they're equal. So like, we know that 2 is essentially equivalent to 2. That's very clear, right? And we know that you know, 1, 2 
is essentially equivalent to 1 comma 2, and that's very obvious. But what about when it's less obvious? How do we talk about the extensional equivalents of functions? What does it mean for two functions to be extensionally equivalent? So, for instance, uh, I have there up there, I take in a lambda, or I have a lambda that takes an x and then adds it to itself. And I have a lambda that takes an x and then multiplies it by 2. Now, these should be the same thing, right? But can we say that these two functions are extensionally equivalent? And it turns out that we can because our definition of extensional equivalence is different for functions. So we say that if I have a function, uh, two functions, f and g, they're from of types t1 to t2, I say that they are extensionally equivalent if for all values that they could take as input. For all inputs, they are extensionally equivalent. So the question is then, suppose I went back to that thing I just told you, these two functions, Is it the case that for every possible value I give, I should get the same value back? At least I should get extensionally equivalent values back for these two functions here. What do you think? I'm seeing some nods. So yes, that is in fact true. Okay. Remember, there's no there's no like random gotchas about arithmetic. There's no gotchas about like how it's implemented. Math is math. X plus x is always the same as two times x. So yes, we have this equivalence. Therefore these two things are extensionally equivalent. That's our rule for equivalence of functions. Functions are equivalent when they behave equivalently, is another way of thinking about it. We reason about functions for how they behave. We reason about values for what they are. Okay? Um, that's, that's kind of one way to think about it. Um, okay. um, and another thing, as I said, uh, in this definition, I say that for all input values, you know, x, fx is extensionally equivalent to gx. Why did I not say that fx and gx reduces the same value? What was that? Who said that? Oh, because they don't, uh, fx, the application of f. So like this, these two functions are not just essentially equivalent because they reduce the same value, but they might be essentially equivalent. Yeah. Yes, if they never reduce to a value, we still want to be able to say whether or not they're equivalent. It doesn't matter if they don't reduce the value sometimes. Like the factorial function, we'll find, doesn't re always reduce. This one's very smashed, but get it anyways. <laughs> okay, so yes, um, uh, if fx and gx loop on some value, I want to still be able to say whether they're equivalent. In fact, we might say that two functions that always loop on every input are extensionally equivalent because they exhibit the same behavior, right? Doesn't matter if the behavior is reducing to a value, the behavior might be looping forever or raising an exception. Is that clear to everyone? Okay, move on. Um, yes, I talked about all of this. So yeah, SML functions can be partial is basically the idea, yes. The same type of exception, yes. And we'll talk about more, that more in uh, five weeks, yes. Um, but uh, good point, yep. Um, okay. And then uh, one other definition I want to give you is uh, it's really inconvenient to talk about partial functions um, because more partial functions are not really mathematical. I mean, some mathematical functions are not defined, but it's, it's a lot nicer when we have functions that are defined on their entire range, as in every input gives me an output value. We call that totality. A function from t1 to t2 is total if for every input I can give it, for all values, v, of type t1, there must be a value of type t2 that it reduces to on that input, right? So every single input has an output value, and then we call that function total. So for instance, div is not total because on zero, it on the input n comma zero for any n, it returns um, an exception, right? It raises an exception, but for uh, plus or not or a string concatenation, they are total, right? Because they never raise exceptions, they never loop forever. I always get a value out when I put values in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep, yep. That, that follows from chaining the definitions. Yep, exactly correct. Um, yep, so uh, that is the definition of totality. We will give it a more thorough treatment in the next lecture, but that's something to be aware of. It's really nice when we work with total functions. We don't have to deal with any looping forever. We don't have to deal with any exceptions. In some sense, that makes our, like, it, everything feels like math in that case. There's some nuances about evaluation that looping forever and exceptions can kind of mess up. But um, uh, total functions are, are nice. Okay. 
Um, cool. OK, uh, I also want to talk about specification. I know you saw this on the homework that's due tonight that hopefully all of you have done. Um, but we want to be able to specify the behavior of code, right? And if we want to specify something, we have to communicate it. And there's a particular format that we use in this class. So uh, we want to write descriptive code, blah, blah, blah. Basically, it looks like this. Okay? I actually left out one, which is the type here. But um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try and document the preconditions and postconditions of a function. What do we need to know about the function's input that satisfies something must be true about the output? Okay? Um, so here's how we're going to do this. We're going to follow something called the five-step methodology. Um, there are five things that are important about a specification that you should always write when you write a function in this class. Okay? And oftentimes, it will be provided to you in the form of starter code. So one is you should write the function's type. So actually, let me do this. So if we were doing this for like the div function, for instance, we'd say comment div type. Wait, what was the type? What was my example? Oh, it was just dividing anything by two by anything. OK, sure, why not? Um, so this is the type. We would write it like this, like an SML comment. And then we'd say, what do, I, what do I require? What is my precondition that must be true about the argument? And uh, if we look at the specification of that divide function, does anyone notice a problematic input for this function? Zero, right? Well, okay, actually, it's written there, so I'm not going to give a high true for that one. Uh, but yes, zero is, zero is problematic. So let's say x is not equal to zero. This is not equals in uh, SML. So we require that's not uh, equal to zero, and then what do we what do we get out from the input, or what do we get out from the function given that we know this is true? What do we know about div x divide rather? What do we know? What should what should the behavior of this function be? It should always give an output. That's, so there's, there's varying degrees of post conditions. Do, always giving an output. Yeah, that's one thing you could say. Uh, another thing we could also just say is that it always reduces to 2 div x, which is you know, but kind of by the definition. It's just kind of silly. But I'm, uh, another way of saying it is like it's always 2 divided. This is a comment. Nothing is evaluating this. It's just for documentation. So if you put down that it's equal to 2 div x, yeah, that's good enough for documentation for anyone. Now I know what the divide function does, because it's not very descriptive from the name. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, under, I underlined it, uh, and then I realized maybe that was a bad move. It's, it's literally just two angle brackets. Left angle bracket, right angle bracket. You can think of it as is, both, is greater than or is less than. It's not, yeah. For the record, you can use this on like a lot of things, not just integers. But that's a different discussion. Um, cool. Any other questions? But that's how we're going to be doing specification. So type requires clause, preconditions, what do I need to know about the input? Postconditions, what do I get out? What, what can I say about the output of um, a uh, behavior? Uh, and then we write the function itself. So we write, like, you know, fun divide, so on and so forth. And then finally, we write tests. You have to write tests. So we highly encourage you to write tests. We have a nice little testing library. Um, uh, that we use. So, oh yeah, I was going to say this. Um, these are just comments, uh, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. If you're using it to test the output type of your function, then yes. If my function returns an int, probably what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to say test dot int, and I'll put whatever here, and then I'll put two int values here. So I'll, I'll probably put like you know, divide three, for instance, here. Uh, and then I'll put whatever I expect to receive out here. And these can be swapped or whatever. Um, uh, but yes, uh, depending on the output type, you might want to use a different kind of testing function because you want to test to add a certain type. So the test function depends on the type of the return. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, I would say that. Um, cool. Um, and and you, to motivate this, this to you a little bit more, right? Like, this is just documenting an API. Right. I'm just saying, what do I expect to get? What are you going to receive out? It's these contracts, these you know, you know, preconditions and postconditions happen all the time. Everywhere you see where there are functions, there is expected behavior. There's a range of inputs I shouldn't expect. There's a range of behaviors I expect to get out. So for instance, I should only call a function with safe values. Maybe I have a library that can only be used in a, in a non-parallel program, a single-threaded program. Maybe I have an API that doesn't work with non-ASCII characters. Like, like these are implementation details. 
But these implementation details have to be surfaced to the user. The user needs to know. So we put them in the form of documentation, in the form of preconditions and postconditions. Um, and then uh, retests again. Uh, this, this is just covering how you write tests. I know it's not fun, but you've got to do it. Sometimes life isn't fun. Okay, Writing tests is important, so you should do it. Um, you write them like this. All right, there will be more on this um, uh, in your homework to come. But uh, the best, one of the best ways to know, the, the best way to know whether or not your function works is to prove it. But because not all programmers are mathematicians and some of them don't have time, they rely for good test coverage. Both are important, I think. Um, but yes, so that's that, and then we can go on. Uh, or at least any questions about this. Cool. So I showed you the factorial function last lecture. It looks like this. Um, but something I want to now talk about is what's the specification of the fact function? Um, and one pertinent question is, is fact total given the definition of total that I gave you earlier? Right? I defined it for you. I'm seeing no's, shakes of heads. Why? Why is it not total? Yeah. Negative input causes what behavior? Loop forever. There's no base case for negative numbers. Because um, we, we go to negative one, and then we, we don't hit, we match against zero, we say no. We go to the next one, we match against this, we say, you know, negative two, for instance, times factor of negative three, and then negative three goes here, and the blah, 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 and we keep looping. So, yes, this will loop forever. But fact on negative numbers is kind of a weird thing to ask for, right? So, probably I should put something in the documentation of this function that says, what do I expect you to do? Um, and I don't particularly expect you to do something like give it a negative number. So I put in my requires, I'm going to require that n is greater than or equal to zero. I'm not going to give you any sensible output otherwise. So oftentimes you'll have functions where they exhibit some interesting behavior, but the interesting behavior is only on certain inputs, right? So you want to use your preconditions, your requires clauses, to enforce that, your docu that, that you only make promises about what happens on certain inputs. Outside of the preconditions, your function can do whatever. Okay, it could loop forever. It could, you know, order a pizza. I don't really care. As long as it's clear from the preconditions that that shouldn't happen. Because you are going to break your own preconditions later. Remember, self-defense against yourself. Yes. I would accept that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Given its precondition, yeah. Um, yeah, total on our range of inputs. I like that. Um, but yes, so... Sometimes we have to make claims only given uh, restricting our input. Okay, any questions on specification? Um, you probably got some practice with this already. Okay, all right. Um, and then, uh, so this is kind of long to look at and annoying for me to type also. So sometimes I'll use these special specification boxes. Uh, these mean the same thing. I'm just using them because I like them and I think they look pretty. Uh, so that's just a remark on side notation, okay. All right, let's move on to recursion. Your best friend for the next like 11 weeks. Um, recursion is the best, and we're going to see why that is. Um, almost as I made the claim to you in the first lecture, almost every function you write in this class is going to be recursive. And that's a great thing, because recursion is the bread and butter of doing anything in a functional language. So here's the definition of recursion. Uh, we say that a function is recursive if it calls itself. Fair enough. Uh, more or more generally, something is recursive, like, you know, um, in language, if it refers to itself. So, uh, for example, this sentence is recursive, okay? Um, but also, one of the best ways to describe recursion, I think, um, is, is from this book about this author called Douglas Hofstadter, who wrote this book called Gödel Escher Bach. And this book is basically very heavy on recursion. And someone said, the definition of recursion is, if you know what recursion is, just remember it. Otherwise, find someone who is standing closer than you to Douglas Hofstadter and then ask them what recursion is. And you see you can iterate this process until, um, uh, until convergence. I thought that Slack was closed, and it is not. Great. Cool. Um, so that's a, that's a nice little example for recursion. But we don't have for loops. Those don't exist in SML. No for loops whatsoever. So even if you wanted to, you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but you don't want to. Okay. So we're, we're trying to save you from yourself. Recursion will be the preferred method to iterate over something. And what we'll find is that it's just more general than for loops. It helps us reason about things. In conjunction with purity, we, can, we find that um, uh, recursion is a really powerful asset. Okay. Um, so usually we say that recursion is something that's taught in programming classes. But it's also a math thing. And why is it a math thing? Well, because precisely the function that I just implemented for you, the factorial function, 
we say that the factorial function is right, a piecewise function. Right? I, I define it on 0 to be 1, and then on any other input, it's n times fact n minus 1. And by the way, ha, huh, this looks exactly like the SML definition, does it not? There's something going on there. Right? So it's a, it's a, recursion is a, a programming thing, but it's also a math thing. Okay? And there's going to be a tight coupling here that we're exploring over this lecture. Recursion and, and induction and math are not so far apart. Um, so, uh, and we saw that the code looked the same. Okay. So, I'm going to tell you now a secret which you should take with yourself for the rest of the class because this will be how you write any uh, recursive function. There's a four step formula. And what we do is first we, we identify something called the base case. The base case is the case of the function that does not recurse. There should always be one, and if there is not one, then your function probably would loop forever. So you identify what the case is based on your input, right? And then you write it. The next step is that you identify the recursive case, so, um, like identify what input. So for factorial, for instance, the base case is when the input is zero, right? And the recursive case is when the input is literally anything else, well, in this case, greater than zero. So we identify and write the base case, and then we identify the recursive case. And then we assume the function already works. We call this the recursive leap of faith. This is incredibly important to be able to get right. If you're thinking about, if you have to think about your recursive function, right, and you have to like unroll it a, a billion times, like you have to say, okay, fact of a four is blah blah times fact of three is blah, blah times fact of two, you're doing it wrong. The really cool thing about recursion is that you can think about an infinite range of inputs by only thinking about one case. Because of this thing I just said, the recursive leap of faith. Assume your function already works, and then through magic self, uh, self fulfilling prophecy, it will. Okay? You just have to ensure that it keeps working so long as you assume that it does. All right? And we'll substantiate what this exactly is um, uh, in like half a section here. Okay? And then write the recursive case. Given that you know that the function already works, write the recursive case. Just do it. And hopefully, if you're writing a recursive function, the answer to the thing you just assumed should help you. Okay? It should. And if it doesn't, then maybe you wrote something wrong or you need to, to alter your code a bit. Okay? Uh, and I already said this about the base case. Any questions on this? And I will show you examples. Okay. So let's go through it. Let's write, let's write a new function. I got the specification for you here. Let's do some pair programming. We've got the pow function, takes in a tuple of two ints, and returns to me an int. It's supposed to evaluate pow nk is supposed to be the power of n to k, right? The exponent n to the k, right? Um, and we require that k is greater than or equal to zero, all right? Um, but how might we write this function? Well, hmm. uh, what's the first step? What do we do? Base case. I heard mutterings of base cases, okay? We're going we're gonna to write the base case. So if I raise any number to the power of zero, I get one. This is one of those facts when I was like in elementary school that I love to go around to people like, what do you think the power of zero is? And they'd be like, zero. And I'd be like, ha, it's one, you fool. Um, <laughs> by the way, there's little reason for a third grader to know that. Yeah, uh, I don't recommend this for you, by the way. But um, uh, if we raise this to the power of zero, we get one. So that sounds like a pretty nice base case for us. Um, so let's write it. Boom. I have any n and I have zero. I would get one as a return value, right? Um, and then this is not real SML code because I haven't written the rest of it for you yet. But that's our base case. Cool? OK. On to the recursive case. What is the recursive case? And what, what I mean by that is like, what input should the recursive case correspond to? Yeah. N and K. Just, yeah, just any N and K. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give a high choose for that one. Uh, I realize I'm wildly inconsistent about when I give high choose, but I'm, uh, you know, that happens. So that's, uh, so one thing to note also is uh, one thing I want to define for you. It might be unclear because we have two inputs here, right? What is really like the recursive case? Well, it corresponds to when this k value, or this k input, is not 0. We call that the variable of recurrence. And the reason is because if you look at it, we cased on when it was 0 here. What it, the variable of recurrence is basically what you're causing to get smaller, in some sense, through every recursive case. And eventually, you'll end up at zero or something that's your final value and you'll stop. So the fact that we, we don't really care about the n here, right? What we're recursing on, the variable of recurrence is k. So I don't really care about the n, so therefore in, in my recursive case, what I really care about is the k value. Okay? Does that make sense? So what we're going to do is we're going to say that the recursive case, we want to be able to do pow nk for an arbitrary k. Well, we're going to use our definition of pow to do it. So recursive leap of faith, assume that pow 
already works, but not already works always, right? Because let me be done. We want to assume that it works on a smaller input. So if I have, if I have pal nk, and this is my variable of recurrence, my k is the thing that's getting smaller, I probably want to assume when k is smaller. The simplest case for this for natural numbers is the minus 1 case. So we assume pow of n, k minus 1. Assume that that works. Okay? And then given n to the power of k minus 1, we should know something about how to solve pow n k in general. Okay? So, uh, so yes, yeah, so, so basically we already assume that pow of n and k minus 1 already gives us the k minus 1th power of n. And then I'm sure you know where I'm going next. How do I get n to the k from n to the k minus 1? Who's got it? Times n, yes. So our recursive case is literally just take this guy that we knew we assumed already worked and then multiply it by n. Okay? There's a tight correspondence there. We, we are going just down one rung on the ladder because in, if you think about the recursion, n is the next step up from n minus 1. Okay? So that's how we implement pow at the end of the day. Any questions on this? This is a fairly simple example of how we use the recursive formula, but I'm telling you that this mindset applies to every function we will write for the next 11 weeks, and it will, re it will really help you as we get to more complex examples. Okay? All right. That's the magic. Any questions? Cool. Okay. Um, but let's look at the formula again. So I, I said this was it, right? But I, I'm feeling a little sense of deja vu. Is anyone else feeling deja vu? This feels like something that I know you all have seen. And given if you saw the table of contents, you might guess where I'm going already. But this looks, something, this looks like something else. What does it look like? What do you think? Induction. Oh, recur you thought it was recursion, but it was induction the whole time. It was induction. Oh my god. Induction and recursion are the same thing. Let's go. There's a four-step formula to proving any simple inductive theorem. They're the same thing. Let's, so we, we, take our, we take our perspective and we just give it a switch. So on to induction, all right? Perfect. Uh, induction. We're going to talk about induction now, your favorite. Um, what I love about induction, I think that the, I think the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu put it best uh, when he said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You see, he was talking about induction. Um, uh, <laughs> you didn't think they had that back then, but they did. Oh my god. Um, so anyways, induction. Uh, so let's talk about mathematical induction, shall we? Does everyone, does everyone uh, rather, does anyone not feel super strong about their uh, memory of induction? Oh, you're all, you're all experts. Okay. Well, it looks like the induction workshop on Friday is going to be empty then. Um, but you should go to that. It'll be helpful. So mathematical induction is induction on the natural numbers. We call it simple induction. It's a proof technique. It's how I prove theorems on the natural numbers. If I have a predicate or a... Uh, property p that holds of natural numbers, p of n, I want to prove it for all uh, natural numbers n. So I use induction to do it. Um, uh, and in particular, in logic, here's what it looks like. It's real scary, huh? But, but here's what it means. Let me, let me demystify that for you. So we say p of 0, logical and, for all n, p of n implies p of n plus 1. And then this whole thing implies that for all n, p of n holds. Okay? I just rewrote the same thing that was on the slide. But the point is, right, this is our base case. We want to prove it for the zero case first. Once we prove it for the zero case, we want to show that for all n, I can get from anything to the next thing. All right? I can take a single step, right? And then if I can take that step from anywhere, then I can go anywhere. I can, I can prove this theorem for any number, for any concrete natural number n. Uh, the way I always like to think about it, or the way I was taught in concepts was, right, um, if you're trying to climb a ladder, you know you can start at the bottom rung, and if you can, you can get from one rung to the next rung, then you can climb to anywhere on the ladder. Okay? That's one way to think about it. It's a nice little visual picture. I didn't fully commit to the bit and bring a ladder. I'm sorry. I thought about it. Um, so, yes. So any step falls in the previous, then we get the theorem for all numbers. Um, now let's go through the, the inductive formula I showed you just a second ago, okay? I kind of showed it to you fast. Um, we identify and write the base case, where base case is defined as 
the case of the inductive proof that does not require an inductive hypothesis. It's kind of a, a similar similarity in vocabulary there. Identify the recursive case, the inductive step, I might say. And then we assume that the induction hypothesis holds, which is this guy. Within our quantification for n, and this is important, by the way. So when I do my base case, I instantiate this n, like any kind of variable, at some kind of variable, right, some n. And then I say that for that thing, I have this, this um, uh, predicate holding, this property holding. And then I go and prove this. Um, there's a difference in kind, if I say this, maybe you'll understand, but a difference in kind between this and that, if that makes sense. Like, you should never assume that for all n, p of n. You should never assume the theorem holds for everything, because then you're assuming what you are trying to prove. That's a mistake, right? You will have points taken off for that. Your TA will go over this with you in lab tomorrow, okay? That, but that's important, okay? Quantification saves lives, all right? Um, in some cases, never mind. Uh, okay, prove the recursive case, or uh, rather, yeah, prove the recursive case, the inducti inductive step under the assumption of the inductive hypothesis. And then you've got your theorem. The theorem holds for all natural numbers n, okay? Okay. And then the base case looks a little different. It's the case that doesn't require an induction hypothesis. This should look very similar to you, right? It feels very similar. They're just the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin, okay? Any questions on induction? And we will do an example. Now I realize that, I should probably, I'll, I'll leave this up. Cool. Okay, let's do something. So S of n, sum of first n, and odd numbers. And what I want to prove is this theorem. I want to prove that S sub n is n squared. Okay, the, the sum of the first n odd numbers is going to be just n squared. If you didn't know that, today you're going to learn. Okay, but what's the skeleton of an inductive proof? Well, I gave you the formula, so what's step one? What do I do first? Base case, BC for short. Uh, and I'm going to say that n is equal to 0, right? 0 is a natural number. Um, well, actually, let's not do that. Let's do one. <laughs> I changed my mind. Let's not do the sum of the first 0 odd numbers. Um, base case n is equal to 1. Well, what's the first odd number? 1. So sn is equal to 1 is equal to 1 squared. Boom. Right? Good? We got the base case. Cool. All right. Induction hypothesis. We assume the theorem, but only for something specific, a specific input. So this, this property, this hypothesis here, this theorem, call it P of n. Well, actually, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to say that. Assume that S of n is equal to n squared for some n. And writing this is the key here, OK? If you write nothing, well, you'll be better off than if you wrote for all n, OK? If you write for all n, you're definitely wrong. But write, write for some, OK? Just, just do it, all right? Um, uh, so we assume that the theorem holds for some n, all right? And then what do we want to show? Well, we want to show s of n plus 1 is equal to n plus 1 squared, right? Well, let's break this apart. What's n plus 1 squared? n squared plus 2n plus 1. Okay, great. Let's keep, let's keep breaking apart equivalences. What else? Where can we go from here? n squared equals s of n. I like it. I like it. By induction hypothesis. So uh, I'm going to cite my sources here, actually. I'm going to say, um, you know, math. By the way, that's OK. You can say that. You, if, you're, if you're asking for a citation, like, hmm, what do I, TA, what do I write for 3 plus 4 equals 7? Just write math. Just do it. It's OK. We're humans. We understand. Uh, we, have, we have stuff to do other than grade, grade your papers. Well, we. But <laughs> um, OK, by math. And then we got to this step by induction hypothesis, right? I said n squared and s sub n are the same. That was what I assumed right here, right? It's the same n. And then what do I do finally? 2n plus 1 is odd, and in particular, it's the next odd number, right? Yep, exactly. The nth odd number is just 2n plus 1. You can think about that. It's just true. You can just cite that. So this is equal to s sub n plus 1, right? Rather, it's equal to, well, hmm. I seem to have turned this inside out. But assume that we, we did it this way. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
That's the proof. Yeah, what's up? We also can prove that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a bit, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Lots of ways to do it. But yes, so now we have our proof. Um, I'll give a high true. I have many high trues. Oh my god, the pieces of the functions are pointer secrets still here. Okay, um, and what I, like to, what I like about this proof is also it's nicely geometric. Uh, you can think of it as like a square. The first, some of the first one odd numbers, some of the first two odd numbers, because this is three, and then the, some of the first three odd numbers is five, right? And it's just a, it's just a square, which is n squared, right? I don't know, I think it's cute. Um, I, didn't, I didn't approach it with that, but you could also do that. Um, you very, very rarely will have the opportunity to picture proof things in this class. Uh, but yes, okay, boom, all of that. Uh, so then by the principle, and then we usually we, we end off saying by the principle of mathematical induction, by simple induction on n, the theorem holds for all natural numbers n, okay? Um, and usually we want to also specify we proceed by state the kind of induction you're doing. Spoiler alert, there's going to be several types of induction you can do, and you can also do it on multiple things, okay? Yeah. I believe there will be all of one proof in this class where you don't necessarily need to do induction. Uh, and I will leave it as an exercise to you as to which one that is. Uh, if you can do it without induction, feel free. The opportunity will not come up very often. It will quite often be an induction proof. I'm giving you that for free. But yes, go for it. If you can break the laws of the universe and then prove something in generality, please do. All right. Cool. Induction, our favorite, right? Um, let's move on. So induction, recursion, not so different. Okay, they feel the same. Instead of a recursive call, I have an induction hypothesis. I'm proving things. I'm implementing things. There's actually a tight coupling. Um, uh, with implementing something or specifying something and then also um, uh, proving it, right? So uh, that's, all, that's another interesting thing. But we'll not go too deep into that. But this should feel very, very familiar. And then, spoiler alert, we're going to take the two, get the best of both worlds when we jam them together and we start proving things about code in this lecture, okay? It's not one of those things where I say, oh, we'll explore that next lecture. We're going to do it this lecture, I promise. Recursion, we use the answers to subproblems. If I have pow of nk, I use pow of nk minus 1, right? Pow of nk minus 1 gets me to pow of nk through some means. This is not, this is like, I don't know, I'll pretend that's implies. I'm, not, I'm trying to show it's not stepping. Yeah, I don't want you to get confused. But it kind of like leads me to pow of nk. In an inductive proof, p of n kind of leads me to p of uh, n plus 1, I guess. Or p of n minus 1 leads me to p of n, whichever. Okay. Like, these are different ways of thinking about the same thing. Okay. The structure looks similar. In induction, I use the induction assumption, inductive assumption to prove my theorem. All right. They're not so dissimilar. Um, the biggest thing you can take away from this section is the recursive leap of faith. Have trust in yourself. It's kind of like a self-confidence thing. Like, yeah, does your function work? Assume it works. Believe in yourself, and then it will. All right. We don't often say, you know, mind over matter. What you think, what you believe goes. But in this case, it's actually quite literally true. So take advantage of that. This is not a self-help class. All right. So we have a difference between writing and verifying. We've seen that we can use induction to help us write recursive functions. Right. We we did that when we wrote pow. Um, we use inductive reason. Oh, it's too far back. Um, we use inductive reasoning to implement the PAL function here, right? Well, that was a proof, never mind. Um, but what we also can do is that we can, use, we can use induction to help us prove our code. We're not just here to write code. We're here to write correct code. So let's write correct code. Um, we can prove SML functions are correct using induction. That's section three. Any questions about induction? The type of induction that I just did up here is not standard. We're not really going to see mathematical induction on numbers for mathematical theorems. We're going to see induction on natural numbers for SML theorems, which are much more fun. OK, cool. All right, we just wrote pow, but let's make sure that it's correct. Now, we wrote it, and I reasoned about it to you. And maybe you're thinking, OK, yeah, it's correct. And it'd be really cool if I pulled a fast one on you, and I was like, actually, it's wrong. No, it's right. But um, uh, let's prove that it's right. Let's make sure that it's right. So. Um, when we're doing an induction proof, usually there's something that we should induct on, right? Um, the correspondence to our variable of recurrence. So what variable should we induct on? 
if we wanted to try and do this proof? What is our input that we are inducting on? OK? I heard from many people. OK. K, right? It's the same. It's the same. The, they're the same thing, just viewed in different lens. I put on my, my induction glasses one day, and then I, I view it as an inductive proof, right? Cool. So the variable of recurrence is going to be typically our, our candidate, right? Um, so let's prove this theorem. And I'm not going to write this one down. Or, uh, yeah, I'm not going to write this one down. OK. Pal of n, comma k reduces to n to the k for all k greater than or equal to 0, right? It is the same value, OK? Um, let's do mathematical induction or a simple induction on k. Now, base case, let's say that k is equal to 0. Well, what can I do here? Um, and actually, let me, let me take a brief hiatus, because actually I want you to have the function definition in front of you while we do this proof. So remember that pal, we defined it as pal taking an n of type int and 0 of type int, returning int equals 1. OK. So for our base case, k is equal to 0, what is our, what is our claim? We want to say something about pow of n comma k. So if we have pow of n comma, n comma 0, what can we say about this? What do you think? Anyone got any guesses? So the structure of an inductive proof on code is that we're just going to try and show this through equivalences. We start with our left-hand side here. We start with pow of n comma k in whatever case. And then we want to prove that it somehow steps to this. Well, what do we have? When you're doing an inductive proof, okay, you have an knowledge bank. Everything I know about my function is here. That is the entire sum total of my function. Nothing else other than like other function definitions uh, is relevant to me here. So I consult my knowledge bank. Well, what do I know? I want to prove that well, I want to show, right? I want to show this. Right? So let's prove it. Well, I have pow of n comma zero. What do I know that pow of n comma zero does? I know that. Given my function definition, given my knowledge bank, it just reduces to 1. Okay, So we say that it goes to 1. And what is 1 also known as? 1 is also known as n to the 0. So we say that this is by, I lied and said I wasn't going to write it down. I'm going to write it down. So we say that by clause 1 of pow, I have that it reduces to 1, which is n to the 0. Is this adequate to prove my case? Yes, this is good enough. That's all I need to know. So then I'm done, OK? Um, so now I just I literally just cite it, and then we know that n to the 0 is 1, OK? Um, my induction uh, hypothesis, I want to assume my theorem. So I assume that pal of n comma k is uh, reducing to n to the k for some k, right? For some k. Next, I want to prove that pal of n to the uh, n comma k plus 1 works. All right, so what do we think about this? Let's start from the left-hand side. So I'm showing you like the algorithm for how you prove these things, right? I'm showing you each step. So we start at how of n comma x, uh, k plus 1. Where do I go from here? Yeah. Second clause, yep. When you, when, to be fair, honestly, in a lot of 150 proofs, there's very few things that you're actually able to do. Like you can kind of just search the space and then find some move you can make. And usually the move you can make is the right one. So let's just start citing equivalences. You're exactly correct. So this reduces to n times pal n k, uh, k. And we're kind of relying on an assumption here, which is that k plus 1 is not 0. Uh, and we kind of just know that because you know k was quantified a certain way. It's, yeah, it should be fairly obvious. You don't really have to cite anything for that. Yeah. So for, for I mean, obviously I don't know what the definition is going to say. Like if we're assuming that k plus 1 yeah, so I don't think the TAs will take off for you for that, but you can say like case assumption, for instance. Like uh, by my case assumption, which is that, you know, I have some k, uh, I should have written some k greater than or equal to zero, but by that assumption, then we know that we're not going to enter the first case. Yeah, that would be perfectly fine to say. Um, yes, so we say clause two, pal, okay? All right, and what do we know about this? Well, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you know where I'm going next, but we have our induction hypothesis. Once we have the smaller input, let's break it down. So we have, well, actually, it's essentially equivalent to n times n to the k, right? This is by assumption. And then what do we know that n times n to the k is? Well, we know that that's n to the k plus 1. I'm kind of mixing math and code here. But for these kind of like meta proofs about math, like it's perfectly fine. 
um, uh, this is just going to be n to the k plus 1, right? By our induction hypothesis, by our assumption of what value pow of n comma k returns. Is that clear to everyone? Yeah. It does. It does matter, and I kind of was, was so, OK. We say that steps to this, and then I'm perfectly fine with you like tacitly assuming that this is, so OK. Pow of n comma k evaluates to n to the k. So actually, this would have been a, a fine thing to say. Um, uh, I wanted to say that these two things were equivalent, but also the indu induction hypothesis gives us that it steps to, right? Um, uh, actually, you might want to write this, because it might take more than one step, or zero or more steps. Um, but generally, as I said in the last lecture, right, um, reduction is stronger than equivalence. If I say reduction, I get equivalence for free. But if I say equivalence, I don't always get reduction. So be careful about what you say, because you might say reduction, but you actually meant equivalence. And then the TA is going to take, take points off your homework. OK, yeah. So there's some cases you can only use equivalence. Suppose I gave you a lemma that said like E1, some E1 is equivalent to E2. Then you could only use it to say that two expressions were equivalent, not that they stepped to each other. Like if I gave you a lemma that said like, you know, 2 plus 3 is essentially equivalent to 1 plus 4, and you wanted to cite this, you would not be able to say that like, f of 2 plus 3 steps to f of 1 plus 4. Does that make sense? Like, I, I wanted to replace this with that because I knew that they stepped, they were equivalent, but it would not be accurate to say that this steps to that. You can think about it, and it kind of doesn't make sense, right? It's not a simplifying step. Yeah. So we're actually not trying to show that it's... We're not trying to show that it's um, equivalent to. We're trying to show that it reduces to. This uh, hook right arrow here means reduction. It means reduction to a value. That's a question which is basically because I said so. Because the theorem says that we want to prove that it reduces to, we don't want to show that it's equivalent to. In this case, it doesn't really matter, because if you're equivalent to a value, that implies that eventually you reduce to it by what I said previous lecture. But in this case, like the, we're, it's reading comprehension, basically. What, you, what we ask for you to prove, you should prove, is basically the idea. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what we're trying to do. When we say reduction, we mean SML really does this. Okay. Um, uh, so, so but you can use your intuition, but also there are a few rules, right? Like we know that f applied to a value must always step into the body of f. Like these are rules that you can just freely cite here because it's a fact you know about SML. We're taking our SML facts and then citing them here. So for instance, clause two, this citation, is my citation that I know an SML fact, which is that pow of n comma k plus one must evaluate to this given this code. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're really like synthesized. All of this is just SML reasoning. But yeah, good, good point. Um, cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, we were doing steps two because, okay. This implies, like this steps two means this as well. By, by saying steps two, I've also said this. But if I, if I only said this, this would not imply steps two. But my, my theorem is asking for steps two. So if I, if I write this, I have not shown you that pow of n comma k plus one steps to this necessarily. I've shown you that it's equivalent. And if you, if you reason about it, if you like kind of think with your brain, you say, oh, well, if it's equivalent, essentially equivalent to a value, it must step to it. But you'd have to justify that reasoning to me too. And I think we'd accept it if you did. Like if you said these are essentially equivalent. By the way, here's a proof that like you know, or like reasoning as to why essentially equivalent things to values must step to it. But you'd have to supplant, uh, supply that extra reasoning, right? It's strictly easier to just say, oh, let me give you the thing you asked for, which is that it steps to. Okay, yeah, good questions. Yeah. It's style, stylistic. I could have done this from pow nk and then gone to pow, uh, pow nk minus 1, and I could have gone to pow nk. I, I just chose it to structure it differently. Like, it, it doesn't matter, right? So like, if I, if I had said this, if I would started from here, I would have quantified that my k 
is still greater than or equal to zero, and I would have gone to k plus one, but it would have been a fine induction step to have taken still, right? Like going, going from k plus one um, uh, downwards versus going from k to k minus one. Oh, oh sure, this is, um, whoa. whoa. Oh, no, okay, so this one is going from k to k plus one, right, because I use k plus one, and I use my recursive call to k. What I, I could have done, pow nk, and then called pow nk minus 1, and that would have been fine as well, because I would have said that k is greater than or equal to 1 in that case. Oh, I, I mean, you have to shift it by 1, right? Because I don't want to, because if I said that k it was like, like I'm a, actually, yes, if I had said that it was this, right, I would not want to have like k to be like negative 1 or something. But if I was, if I was here, I would not want to assume that k is just 1 because this will not connect with my base case. Because this would now go to uh, one. Yeah, which is not pow of n income to zero. Basically, you have to make sure that your induction steps and your hypotheses line up. If I had assumed that theorem, for instance, for greater than or equal to two, okay, what would I do? If I had said that k is greater than or equal to two, I'd get three, or sorry, two, two plus one, and I get two here. But then this would never actually reach my base case because I have pow of n comma two, which is not my base case of pow n comma zero. So what I'm trying to show you is that like where you, where you quantify the bound of your variable interfaces with the casing that's done by the function itself. Because of the fact that our base case is zero, we want to quantify our k such that we eventually rely on pow n comma zero, if that makes sense. There will be more detailed treatment of this um, in lab or the induction workshop. But yeah, that's the basic idea. Um, it doesn't really matter, like, these are basically a lot of coding, coding, um, uh, and what I mean by coding, I mean encoding, right? Um, it don't, doesn't really matter how you specify it so long as the form, the content is correct. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, let's move on. Um, so I showed you this kind of connection between induction and recursion, and we're going to make that concrete because we have kind of this relationship. Our base case in the program and our base case in the proof are the same. My recursive call and my induction hypothesis are the same. My variable of recurrence and my induction variable, I'll say, are the same. Okay? This is what you should take away from this. All right? Programmatic thinking is mathematical thinking. I have this here to remind you every now and then. Um, I am actually farther in than I thought. So I'm, uh, what you're going to have to do now is you're going to have to get into your groups. All right? Get into your houses, take your quiz, grade scope, five minutes. If you're in blue team on my left, yellow here, I love Brandon in the back. Same as last time. Uh, okay, how do you feel about the quiz? Who thinks they won? What houses are they? I don't even know why I asked. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully all of you think you won. What was, what was the answer to question six? Huh? Shout it out. Shout it out. Three, two, one. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. You guys, just, you guys said it and then you kept going and I got confused. All right. Cool. All right. We'll see you at the end of lecture. All right. I'm, uh, <laughs> you are graded. Uh, quiz time. Um, so we're done with that. Let's move on. I got to show you this for lab tomorrow. I promise. Um, unfortunately, there was some feedback about how you wanted me to go slower, and I tried to go slower. Uh, unfortunately, that means that I have a lot of stuff to cover. I'm not going to get to all of it. But you can read through the slides on your free time, and uh, please do, because I worked really hard on them. Okay? Um, all right. So we, sh we saw function clauses. I can do fun fact zero, fun fact n, and that's called a function clause. Okay? I match to whatever clause uh, in linear order to pattern match on the value I take as input. But we also have these things called case expressions. A case expression looks like this. I case on an expression, uh, who would have guessed, and then I look at some, at some particular cases, right? So I have, for instance, case two of one goes to three, four goes to four. This is the wild card pattern, right? The syntax of a case is that we have a bunch of arms, we have a bunch of cases, right? Only the first one has a, has a bar in front of it, which was a language mistake by the designers of this language. But um, uh, it is what it is. Uh, but so don't put a don't put a bar here if it's uh, the first case. Usually we will indent it like this, right? So we'll put it on the same indentation level as the case. Um, and then does anyone want to hazard a guess as to looking at this, like what they think that it does? What do you think this evaluates to? Four. I heard four. Who said four? All right. Uh, yes, it goes to four because two is not one, right? Um, another thing to realize is that. For the same reason as if then else expressions, case expressions have the same typing rules. Every single expression returned, that is these two here, have to have the same type. Because otherwise, what do I get? 
type unsafety, right? I could potentially produce a different type in each branch, and that's bad. So it won't type check, and ill-typed programs don't run, right? So make sure that these are the same type, okay? That's important to know. Um, and we're going to speed through this, but fact I, I wrote with function clauses earlier, an equivalent form to it is I could write this. This should look pretty similar, right? It's just I case on n. If it's 0, I go to 1. If it's anything else, I go to n times fact n minus 1. Fair? Um, Something to note is that I could have written this with n here instead of wildcard. Um, but what it would have done is it would have done the same thing, basically. I would have shadowed n with n. I would have produced a binding to n that was n. Does that make sense to everyone? I'm kind of like going through this fast, but like it doesn't really matter. Uh, if I had written a wildcard here, and I did, I'm using the n that was here. But if I put like x or something here, I'm producing a binding by matching n to x. And if I'd matched it to n, it'd be the same thing. Um, uh, this is just like kind of like syntax. But um, uh, the point is that like, I could have written either of those things. Um, but case is still an expression. So if I, I'm free to write something like this. And this will evaluate to 6, right, eventually. Um, uh, because what happens is at first I evaluate the case, and I get 4, and then I get plus 2. All right, and then I get 6, OK? Case expressions, everyone cool? Yeah. In SML, usually we're going to favor function clauses um, uh, as opposed to cases. Um, I think it makes I think I think the reason for that is it makes the proofs easier because you say by clause one of law, by clause two of function. In reality, I think it makes the code a little bit uglier, but that's just me. Um, uh, I work in a language where we don't have function clauses. It doesn't matter. But um, uh, yeah, I, no real real reason. Stylistic preference. Yeah. Um, cool. So it's totally okay to write this. Another thing I need to tell you about are lists. I showed you very basic things. I showed you ints, I showed you bools, I showed you strings. But sometimes we are interested in keeping n or oh, zero or more things, right? We're interested in like a list of objects. You know Python, um, Python has lists. But SML's lists are a little bit more special. So before I can define lists for you, I need to talk about the type. So we say that there's a type T list. This T is code, right? Um, for any type T. So if I have int, which is a type, I also have int list. If I have bool, which is a type, I also have bool list. Not now, mom. Uh, and if I have a, if I have int list, I also have int list list. Okay. This is I can iterate this process. I can get lists out of lists. But every element in a list needs to be of the same type is a restriction that I have for you. Okay. It's not like Python, you can just shove everything in the list. They all have to be the same type. So here are some examples. Uh, and this is the syntax we will use. The syntax is square brackets and then stuff in between. All right. So this thing here, we call nil. That's called pronounced nil, and it's the empty list. And nil is of type int list. It's also of type bool list. If I have a list that has comma separated values, um, it has the type of whatever the entries elements are, or uh, types are. So, you know, left, uh, uh, square bracket 1, comma, 2, comma, 3 is int list, right? Because it's a list of integers. In particular, it has three in them. If I have this one, which has high string, and then their string in there, it's a string list. Okay? Should be fair, fair enough. Um, the syntax should make sense. Um, but what if, so, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, it will, but please type annotate your vowel declaration. The, yeah, so the official answer is the type it interprets it as is don't worry about it for three weeks. Oh, God. Yes. It'll be something called a polymorphic type, and we'll talk about it in two weeks. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, but yes, you're getting, you're, getting, you're getting ahead of me. Um, yeah. Uh, and if you do really special things, it'll complain about some question mark dot x1 nonsense at you. And if you, if you see that, you really messed up and really don't think about it. It's like the Wizard of Oz. There's a man behind the curtain. I'm trying to tell you not to worry about it until we get far enough. Yeah, yeah, but good question. Um, and also, I have a case where I have a list where the entries themselves are int lists. So this is a list of one thing where the one thing inside is a list of two things. It's the same, sort of the same deal as tuples, right? OK, let's move on. Um, but I can specify a list inline like this. But what if I want to add to a list? I use something called cons uh, using a constructor. So a list is two things. This is the one thing you should think about. A list is two things, two possible variants, two possible ways a list can appear. One of them is nil, which is the empty list of type t list for some type t. Okay? The other thing 
is that it can be cons, this thing is called cons, and this infix. So it can be, for instance, one cons the empty list. And this is just syntactic sugar, or rather, this is just syntactic sugar for that. Okay? What I mean by that is that cons is like, it's like a function. A constructor is like a function. It is not a function, but it is like one that takes in two inputs. It takes in, in particular, something of type t and another list, and it is a list. So it basically, this is like prepend. Um, cons takes in an element and puts it into a list, except it doesn't do any work to do it. It kind of just is the list. So if I say something like, um, uh, well, sometimes it does work. But um, uh, if I said something like this, this means take two, put it in this list as the first element. Okay, and an element, a list can either be empty or it can be something in front of another list. It's a recursive definition, right? Are you, are you fairly convinced that like a list that is nothing or an element cons onto another list, like a, an element in front of another list, then you can achieve any list ever, right? Because you can just put whatever elements inside. This is a simple recursive definition that suffices to define any list ever, okay? And I, I'm being abstract in the type because this works for any type, okay? So like I have, you know, I have um, uh, the empty list, and suppose I want to cons on high. We say, we might describe this as consing high to the empty list. And this is of type string list. Okay, I can iterate this. I can say, uh, I don't know, hello. Um, and this is right associative. That means that if I just write this in line, like, hello, cons, high cons, nil. This is interpreted as this, OK? Because otherwise, I wouldn't type check, right? Because if I, did, if I did this, I would be consing a string onto a string. And a string is not a list. So this wouldn't type check, right? So anytime I write cons, it's right associated is uh, the point. Okay. This is just syntactic sugar for or rather, like, like this stuff is just syntactic sugar for this. This is syntactic sugar for that. Okay, it's just a nice shorthand we can use to write it. Yeah. Uh, the top, the the bottom is the top secretly. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think I erased that. Sorry, I meant to write this is of type string list, but yeah. OK, cool, good question. Um, probably going to have to move on here. You'll get a more detailed treatment of this tomorrow. Um, OK, so I talked about that. Constructors are patterns, which means that we can case upon it. I'm going to show you real quick an example. Uh, this is the isEmpty function. I'm talking about a function of type int list to bool that returns true if it's empty and false otherwise. Because constructors are patterns, if I case upon a list, I get either nil goes to true, or I get cons of two things goes to false. Right. A list is one of two things. It is either empty or it is one thing attached to another list. Okay? That's a mantra. You repeat that to yourself. A list is either empty or it is one thing cons onto another list. All right? And that's how we destruct a list. We, by repeatedly consing things off of a list, by repeatedly taking things from the front, we get to any element. In SML, there is no O of 1 list indexing operator. You have to go and retrieve whatever you're looking for. Okay? Um, uh, that's the idea. Um, yeah. The list after, um, following it, but yes. Yeah, yeah essentially. Uh, if you look at the memory, which you shouldn't have to think about, but yes, that is what happened. Yeah. Um, cool. This is the is empty function. Very simple. Um, okay. Let's. We were going to write a simple inductive uh, formula on lists. But um, uh, look at this in your spare time and convince yourself this is correct. It's just finding the list of the element by taking off one element and then adding one. Uh, the point of this is that you get comfortable with the syntax. That's what I care about. Okay? Be comfortable with using lists. But I got to move along because I promised there was one thing I would show you before lab tomorrow, and I have some time. Okay. I said something about how I'd show you fast exponentiation. Um, uh, we sh I showed you pow nk, and pow of nk that I showed you uh, computed n to the k by multiplying by n k times, right? I did, I did k multiplications. If you're really into math, uh, you might know that, in fact, you don't need to do k multiplications to do it. There's a method called repeated squaring, and it takes advantage of the fact of these two facts here. So if I have uh, k as an odd number, 
then n to the k is just going to be n multiplied by, and then this is the floor operator, right? So like, like um, if I have k over 2, and I, that's like 3.5, the floor of that is 3. So this is equal to n times n to the floor of k over 2 squared, OK? And then if, if k is even, this should be a little bit more clear. It's n to the k over 2 quantity squared, right? Because exponent rules means I multiply this by 2, so I get n to the k. Um, and this is basically just because we have to deal with the offset from the odd. Um, these are two fun facts. But if you look at this, this is a mathematical definition. And what are mathematical definitions? They're programmatic definitions, because programs and math are the same. So you see n to the k over 2 squared. I see two recursive calls. All right, so we'll, we'll exploit that technique. All right, well, one recursive call. We'll see. OK, um, so let's turn the mathematical definition into a program. All right, let's do it. I'll let you read this for a second. But the idea is I want a fast PAL function. n to the 0 is still 1. But if I have n to the k, if k is even, that is, if k mod 2 is 0, then I'm going to say that it's equal to n to the k over 2 multiplied by itself. Right? That's exactly the definition I gave you on the previous slide. Otherwise, if it's odd, I do n times, well, n to the k minus 1. I, I change it slightly because this makes the proof easier. Um, uh, but don't worry about it. It's, it still works, right? Um, uh, so this is the definition. Is everyone convinced that this also like, works? It is a PAL function. Like, it is the same PAL function, just implemented slightly differently. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I adjusted this slightly. So um, yes, it works. But I promise you that we would do less multiplications. Does anyone see a problem here? Do you think that this is actually achieving that? Yeah. You can see me preparing the Haichu, but yes. Yes, um, that is indeed what happens. If I'm calling the recursive call twice, I'm repeating the same work. A really smart compiler could optimize this out, but what, what's optimization? Okay? You're, doing the, you're doing the call twice. Okay? We pretend we don't know about that. So in this case, we're going to be doing exactly the same, or maybe even more. I don't know. Uh, I haven't actually. You know what? Uh, so I wrote a debugger for SML a while ago, um, and basically here's how it works. It's a stepper. Uh, suppose I have the old pal, which is pal two comma four. Pal of two comma four is equal to casing on two and four of these two things. We step into the second case because four is not zero, right? So we get 2 times pow of 2 and 4 minus 1. And then this, in turn, steps to uh, this thing. Don't worry about this. Uh, but this steps into that, right? And if we iterate this enough, you should see that like this. Oops, sorry. If we iterate this enough, you should see that this number goes down, right? We're doing 1 minus 1 now. So we're, you should be convinced, like, this is what the pow function really does in SML, right? Um, and we get this. But let's suppose that we had a really big example. Suppose we were doing pow of 2 to the 50. And fast pal, as I have defined here for you, of 2 comma 50. No, this is actually the faster one. Um, uh, but uh, don't worry about that. So if I did mulligan test2.sml, let's look at what pal 2 comma 50 does. Let me just hold down the enter key for you. It's doing 50 multiplications. All right? And this is going to take a while. It's going to take a while, and then eventually it'll overflow. OK? Um, uh, which, don't worry about that. I, pretend that didn't happen. But the point is, um, uh, the point is that Doing this call twice is going to induce a lot of multiplications, all right? But remember something we learned about. We learned about referential transparency and purity, which means that these two calls, right, do you believe that FastPow is a pure function, always the same outputs given the same inputs? Then shouldn't we be able to call it just once and reuse that answer? So let's, let's remember that. Um, so the thing I have to show you now is to do that, we're going to use something called let expressions. Um, some of you ask, like, how do I declare a variable in an expression? We do it using a let expression. A let expression says, let me declare these variables in this expression. And I can use that inside of a function. Um, so for instance, this is an expression. So let val be equal to uh, x be uh, equal to 2 in the expression x plus x. And then add that to 3. Okay? So this whole thing will evaluate to 2 plus 2, which is 4 plus 3 is 7. I'm kind of speaking through this because I kind of have to show you this. But I'm, uh, uh, the point is also that like, when you do this let, it's what's called lexically scoped. So the value, uh, the variable you declare here is only visible within here. If I do let val y equals 3 in for end plus y, this y is not in scope, right? Because I said let y be a thing only in this expression, OK? Um, so let's rewrite it. So the point is what I wanted to do is you can write if k mod 2 equals 0, then 
do a let binding to declare this half ands variable that's equivalent to fastpal of n k div 2. Okay, so now I, I bind it to a variable, so now I can reuse it without writing it in line twice. All right, so I'm going to say half ands times half ands, and if you were paying attention, this, this is equivalent to that, so this is exactly the same code as what I wrote before. Why? Because referential transparency, right? It's pure. Um, so now we have at maximum one recursive call to fastpal. All right, and what I wanted to do was I wanted to prove to you, in the next few slides there's a proof that like they're equivalent. Uh, I'm not gonna have time to do that, but I will have time to show you. Because if we look here, this is the same fastpal I just showed you, the one that makes one recursive call. We saw this pow 2 comma 50, which does, you know, ungodly things, right? Let's comment that out and try it out. And then now, very fast, right? I, I'm not going to step through everything for you, but basically look at this. Like we're taking 25, and then we have 25 minus 1, and then we have 24, and then we have uh, 12. 12 is here, and then we divide by 6, 2 is 6. Basically, if you follow it through, you're going to find that, like, we're going to be doing less work overall. We have, and then you can see that it takes less time to step through. So that's basically what I wanted to show you. Um, we don't have time to get, oh, whoops, what the heck, okay. We don't have time to get to the proof at the end, but I recommend you look through it on your own. Uh, this is an extensional equivalence proof that proves that two implementations are the same. I can prove to you that pow and fast pow do the same thing, modulo a lemma, okay? I didn't prove that it was faster, three weeks. Three weeks, we will prove that it's faster, yes. Yeah. You can indeed, yes. Uh, please do this lecture survey, it helps me. Um, wait, TAs, you know who won? Yellow, yellow won! Good job. Who's in, who's in yellow, who's in yellow? I got more high shoes. I got more high shoes. Yellow? <laughs>